their faith is growing, their understanding and our their ability to articulate the things of God was growing. And it was directly impacting the leadership of our church because our team is the ones that's that's leading our people each week. Hey, I'm Andrea Olson. I've been leading worship and training worship leaders for nearly 20 years. And my mission is to support worship leaders just like you in volunteer supported ministries because I know what it's like. I've been there. It's amazing, but you have a big job. And sometimes you might feel a little bit alone, but I'm here to remind you that you aren't. We'll cover spiritual and leadership growth, practical resources, and get encouragement from other worship leaders from all over the world. I truly want to see you lead from the overflow, not the overwhelm. So grab a cup of tea or coffee and join me. Welcome to the Overflow Worship Podcast. Well, I am so excited today to welcome a guest back to the podcast. We were just chatting before we hit record that we can't quite believe it's been two years since we last talked, so we have a lot to catch up on. I'm so excited to welcome Brett Perkins from Journey Worship Co. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So honored. Absolutely. So glad to have you back. So catch us up a little bit. Tell our listeners, you know, for those who are new, maybe a little bit about you and the journey God's had you on the last few years. Yeah. So I'm, uh, as you said, Brett Perkins, worship pastor at the Journey Church in Lebanon, Tennessee. Um, came here just over seven years ago just to be a part of the culture. We loved it and um, wanted to dive in. And so we moved here, started a family here. Um, and it's been an incredible thing to be a part of. I think the last time that we talked, uh, I had just released my, my last record solo and we were embarking on a journey of what it looked like to start something within our walls. And since then we have started it. Uh, it's called journey worship co and it's just a collective effort to, Uh, fight for truth for our people, the right songs that matter, that are clear and truthful. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of, that's a nutshell, really quick nutshell. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's amazing to me how, you know, I mean, obviously when we're in it, it feels maybe long or like a lot of work, but also, I mean, two years isn't that long. So right. look what God's done and the uh, the process that he has had you on. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how, how you started with Journey Worship Co. Like two years ago, you were just kind of, you know, diving into it. So tell us what that's been like since then. Yeah, the, the origin of it was really a mixture of uh, convictions. One conviction was I wanted to merge what was happening on the road. Uh, again, I was just out, I was with a band, but it was just under my own name. But I thought what we had at our church was really unique. And I wanted to merge what was going on on the road with what was happening inside our walls. I just felt like it was a better um, offering to people to have variety and multiple voices. Um, and I'm a church boy at heart. I love the church. I love the local church. I believe in the local church. I believe the local church is the hope of the world when Jesus is the center. And so mm-hmm. uh, I wanted to just merge it all and put it together. Yeah. But also, I didn't want to start writing uh, just to add to the noise. I wanted to have a reason um, mm-hmm. to to do something. And so uh, when 2020 hit, everything shut down and it gave us a good opportunity to assess all the resources that were um, resource in our church. And for me as the worship pastor, it made sense for me to look at the worship music and, um, you know, it, there's something really formative about leading to a, a camera lens when there's no one in the room. Uh, yeah. it makes you think about what songs actually say. And I just realized that there seemed to be this growing trend of music that, uh, was sacrificing content at the altar of creativity. Mm -hmm. And um, what I mean by that is there, there were songs that it wasn't that they were uh, untrue as much as they were unclear. And uh, you would take a creative route as opposed to a clear route. 
in writing a song and it and it really hinged on music to bring about some type of emotion with people in the room but if no one's in the room you don't have that response or reaction so all you have when everything else is stripped away is the truth of the song itself and i just saw that there was a deficiency particularly in in the pool that we were pulling from so there was this gap that uh, became a need for us and uh, a need seen became an assignment given for us and so we started writing songs uh, fighting for truth for our people trying to not not sacrifice content or creativity um, but something that just fit our lane and uh, that was the origin of Journey Worship Co. We got together we had a team night where we ate, we played games, we sang together, we had fun, and then we casted vision, and I introduced this new uh, idea to them, and they all got pretty excited about it, and uh, the rest is kind of history. We started writing, and our people connected to it. We needed a band name. Our church is the Journey Church. Journey yeah. is already a band that exists. So Journey Worship goes yeah. where we landed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's that's really yeah. such a powerful story and process. And I want to say journey because I can't think of a better word. It's okay. But, people no, people no, want to like, not say uh, it. But it's like, ah, it's okay. I know. I get it. <laughs> It's like not intending the pun, but it is. It's an awesome journey <laughs> yeah. that you guys have been on. And so what does that look like from a standpoint of like within your team? Is it everybody is, is writing and contributing? Are there a few people who are really passionate about writing? I mean, obviously in Nashville, you probably have a lot of people who write anyway. Yeah. Uh, but what does that look like? Yeah, it was interesting to, to throw this idea out there because I didn't really know uh, what the possibilities were or what kind of resources we had. Um, I'd listened to a podcast that really challenged me about writing. Uh, and it was a simple challenge. It said your, your uh, biggest untapped resources are the people in your seats. And I just wanted to explore what that looked like for us. So uh, I just said, hey, we're going to do an all call. If you want to write, we're going to write. And if you're available and you want to put in time. I mean, it, we, we allotted three hour time blocks. So it was a commitment yeah. to be here. Yeah. And we did, we did two blocks a day on our days that we did team rights and we did quite a few of them. Um, and so I just, I brought them in and then over time, I mean, I think we had for the first record, we had about 18 different writers come in hmm. and I tried to, I tried to limit as much as I could to like three or four people to write. Mm -hmm. Sometimes because of the number of people that came, we had to put five in a room. And I just wow. learned that that was a lot, um, especially for <laughs> new writers. There was a lot of ideas and not a lot of product um, yes. early on. But over time, uh, as I was able to write with people, uh, there was a, I had a mentor who taught me uh, quite a bit about songwriting. And he just, he said, every song has content, melody, and arrangement. And most writers can do one really well and do another one decent and the other they need help on. Um, it's rare for writers to be able to do all three really well. And so I just, I kind of took that formula and I started trying to find people who contributed to content, people who contributed with melodies and people who contributed with arrangement and celebrate the things that they did well. Um, I wanted, I felt like my job really was kind of like a GM of a baseball team in a lot yeah. of ways. I was just trying to find who was gifted at what, celebrate that, encourage them in it, and tell them to run in that lane and be okay with uh, deferring on some of the other stuff. But some of that was like, I had to know what I was good at too and where I needed help so I could use that as an example. Um, but over time, uh, we were able to build some pretty solid teams 
And there are other people who had a pretty good self-awareness that were like, I'm not really interested in writing at all. I'd rather just lead on Sunday. And so that was helpful too. There was just a, there was a lot of humility on our team that I think made it more exciting than uh, as burdensome as it could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I was thinking about this book that I read a while back and it was a leadership book and it was talking about how great leaders understand what their strengths are and they, they stay in that lane and they delegate the other things, right? Or yeah. in your case, like empowering other people in what they're great at in their lane. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not that we never cross over and all of those things, but it's like just what an empowering thing for your team to be able to know like, hey, I, I've i been validated and valued in this and I know that I'm good at this. Somebody else saw that yeah. and now I can, I can run in this lane and feel confident. And I think that's such a powerful thing. And it's, it, I would imagine because of all the teams that I've worked with that that was an incredible team building experience for your, you know, for everybody on the team, whether they wrote or not. And so tell me a little bit about that. What has that done for you internally as, as a team? Yeah. Well, one of the big things that like I've shared with, with a few people in regards to writing that was like, I didn't know the impact that it was going to make until it made it. And then I was like, that is so genius. I didn't think of all of this myself. (laughs) Um, You know, like I said, we started writing to fill a purpose. We had a why behind us and a conviction that, that drove us. And that was we wanted to write theologically rich songs to serve our people particularly. Mm. And um, because of that, we needed some gatekeepers who knew theology and were going to lead us down the path to um, to uh, clarity and truth. And so what I did was I pulled in some pastors to be in rooms with our writers. Oh, wow. And uh, they aren't musical I mean, they listen to music, but that's the extent of it. They sing on Sundays in their seats, but that's really the extent of it. They don't play instruments. They don't know arrangements. They're not going to contribute to melodies. They may have melody ideas, but we're not going to listen to them for the most part. (laughs) Um, But the the incredible thing is what happened was whenever they were in the room, uh, they had three hours with my team Hmm. with an open word of God. And my team was being discipled by our pastors of our church in a like expedited way. I mean, it was like such an intentional time um, for us to be able to invest in my team in particular. But as my team was invested in, their faith is growing, their understanding and our their ability to articulate the things of God was growing. And it was directly impacting the the leadership of our church because our team is the ones that's that's leading our people each week. And yeah. so uh, as we grew in uh, chasing down this mission or attacking this mission of like writing songs and whatnot, we also grew in our understanding of the Lord together and that strengthened us. So like yeah. that was just one one piece of it that I think was huge and still is huge. But then the other piece is we've over the years developed this culture of just celebrating one another. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it, I'm telling you, it's such a selfless team. Uh, everybody's more concerned about everyone else on the team. And wow. if you were to just sit in our green room, it's it's not a lot of look at me. Uh, this is what I'm up to. It's a lot of asking questions about like, tell me about your job. Tell me, tell me about your family. How are they doing? Asking by name. I mean, our team knows each other and loves each other and cares for each other. But I do think that this has played a role in developing a unity because when we're together, we can celebrate wins together. Um, and even even um, adding in the fact of traveling, we have a, a team that travels a significant amount 
Uh, mm-hmm. But when we when we miss on Sundays, we kind of have this home team, road team language where we're checking yeah. on, in on one another. And we know that the road doesn't happen if home isn't taken care of. And yeah. so even even the travel ministry of Journey Worship Co. is fueled by those who stay. And um, I mean, I'm thinking about Daniel Wolfenbarger. You don't know his name, but he's a massive role on our team. He leads the way whenever we're whenever we're not here. And he has hmm. he's a local barber. He cuts my hair. He's a close That's friend, um, and he has a lot of leadership change with our people. And so when we're gone, they feel like they're in good hands because they are. And he's a familiar face who leads really well. And that's just, that's just one name of many. Um, but just to highlight him, um, we, we have such a broad team and, and there's a celebration, uh, of one another. It's not, it's not a, like, I think in some cases, um, teams like this could get competitive of like, well, I don't get to go and do that. And I didn't write on that song or whatever, but we just try to keep a family, collaborative, celebratory, uh, selfless mindset in front of us. And um, it's been really, really healthy. I'm really mm-hmm. thankful for it. Yeah, absolutely. At, it sounds like you all have something really special. And, you know, developing that kind of relationship and that kind of team culture, if you will, is not something that happens by accident. It takes intentionality and it takes, you know, focus and taking intentional steps towards building that. And so besides, you know, some of the things that we I've picked up on along the way of just that intentionality, the humility, the uh, relationship focus. Are there any other specific intentions that you've set as a leader? Because I can tell that, you know, it's really important to you to really preserve that special atmosphere and culture that you guys have. So what are a couple of the other intentional steps that you've put in place to make sure that you guys stay on that on that road? Um. It's a good question. I've, I've not really thought about the codifying of it all, um, but it's a good <laughs> question to work through. Um, you know, I um, when I got to this church, we didn't have the, the team that we have now. Um, it wasn't really unified, and uh, it was really hard. So for anyone listening, if you're in a bad spot or if you have a – divisive team, or maybe you're not even liked right now. Um, I would, I would say I'm a, uh, I'm living proof of one who has walked through that culture and I'm on the other side and it's a better culture. Um, Mm -hmm. I think you have to be, if I'm thinking through some of those lessons that I learned in that season that have been helpful even now in a, in a, healthy culture. Uh, it's, you have to be willing to address conflict. Yeah. You have to be willing to address, um, potential conflict as well. Like if you, if you can forecast as a leader that if we keep going down this road and if, if certain things continue to be allowed or enabled, then this will become an issue. So addressing issues before they're before they're issues, so that they don't become issues, um, is key. But it it requires a level of uh, perspective for you as a leader and intentionality to see like the team as a whole. Um, it also requires listening um, sometimes. You know, last year to to be completely. Frank, just for the sake of hopefully is helping somebody. Um, yeah. Daniel, I referenced him. Um, he, he wanted to have lunch with me in the summer and we were busy, super busy. And we had missed a few Sundays and, uh, he brought up some concerns that he saw and, uh, they weren't easy for him to bring up and they weren't easy for me to hear. Uh, but had he not brought those up, then the concerns wouldn't have been addressed or fixed 
and it could have become a bigger issue. But he trusted me that I would listen, and I respected him when he addressed them to me. And uh, we were able to make some some changes and uh, some decisions that that shifted away from potential issues. And he helped me do that. And so I, I just I think that there's um, creating a culture that's willing to uh, talk about hard things. Like you want to, you don't want to take yourself too seriously, but you want to take your job really seriously. And I think so many times leaders, um, you, you could have two different ditches. One, the leader that doesn't want to address any kind of conflict. Uh, and then the other one who is bullheaded and doesn't listen. Um, mm-hmm. and it's just like my way or the highway. And I think you have to be able to stand in the middle and, uh, keep the mission of the church and the team ahead of you. Know that the team is bigger than you yourself. Um, it's bigger than any one person and just fight for unity in a God honoring way. And I know this whole answer is about conflict. Um, but I, I do think that communication and addressing, uh, issues is a massive thing that, that really expedites unity. And it doesn't always feel that way, but um, but on the other side of it, there's clarity, and I think clarity breeds unity too. Um, so that's like that's a big thing. I mean, smaller things. We have team nights. We don't have them as as often as I'd like to, but we try to intentionally have like two or three a year where we get together and we just play and laugh and eat really good and uh, spend time with one another. And every time we're together, I try to have a passage that we can walk through uh, to just fight for unity and uh, cast vision and then celebrate wins. You know, if somebody had a baby, we want to, we want to acknowledge that if someone, uh, if someone celebrates something within their, their business, uh, outside of the church, we want to celebrate that. But also, uh, mm-hmm. if our songs are reaching other countries, then I want to bring it to light. Like, y'all, your mm-hmm. efforts inside the walls of the Journey Church in Lebanon, Tennessee, are impacting somebody in Australia right now. And when you're asleep, these songs are ministering to people who are awake. Mm-hmm. Um, just little things like that. And then anytime we have rehearsals uh, or pre-service meetings, we always want to have the word open uh, and um, the truths of scripture driving us and our mission. Because, I mean, you know, leading worship at a church, you do a lot of the same songs in different seasons and it could become monotonous if you forget why you do it and if, Mm -hmm. if you forget who you're worshiping and who you're serving. Mm -hmm. And so we just, we want to keep the why in front of us and um, continue to consider one another over ourselves Mm -hmm. in all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There's so much there, so much uh, just powerful encouragement and leadership guidance for all of our listeners. And I just, I see so much intentionality in the in the things that you have set in, in motion, but also just, you know, what I hear from all of that is to be an approachable leader, you know, somebody who people know that they can approach and talk to, like you said, your friend who came to you and was like, I, you know, I'm trusting you with this. I know that I can, that I can bring it to you, even though it's really not super fun to talk about. And that takes maturity on his behalf as well, but on, on yours and as a leader to be that one who is approachable and they know that they can, um, that they can come to you with those things because that, that builds a healthy team foundation as well. And so it, 
it, it's it's not easy. <laughs> it takes a long time. Like you said, when you came in, you know, it's been a process. And so for all of our people who are listening, I hope that this is encouraging to you that there is so much hope for your, your team and for building something that um, you just feel excited about and, uh, you know, excited about how they're growing and how you're, how you're moving towards the Lord together. And so is there anything else before we, we wrap up along those lines that you would like to say to our listeners, to encourage people who maybe are in that spot that are like, I don't even like have team culture, you know, like yeah. I don't even, I don't even know where to start because maybe they're brand new. Like you were seven years ago. What would you say to them? Yeah, I would just say to love people. Um, and it sounds so cliche, but when I came in, I've, I've said this before to different folks. I I was really young. I was 25 leading my first team of people who were a decent amount older than me, and they weren't giving me a shot. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I came in trying to figure things out, but also trying to prove myself. I kind of had a chip on my shoulder, honestly, from different cultures that I'd been in of people who didn't believe that I could do it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And, um, so I had really thin skin and a really thick heart. Um, things just got to me and I wasn't really compassionate when they got to me. And Mm -hmm. something I learned over time is you need to have as a leader, you need to have thick skin and a soft heart. Um, you you need to be able to receive blows without losing your footing underneath you. And a lot of that comes from understanding your identity in Christ and knowing that your approval is not something you work for. It's something that you work from. If you're in Christ, you already have right standing with the father and that's all the approval that you need. Um, Paul talks about that in, I think it's first Thessalonians. It, that's what led him to then give of him his whole self to people, even when he could have asked things from them as an apostle. Um, he didn't because he knew his approval was from God in Christ and he gave of his whole self in his ministry. And so I think loving people with your whole self, uh, not asking anything from them, not trying to be burdensome in your requests with them. Um, even pursuing the people that are hardest to love, uh, take them out to lunch, give them an opportunity to give you a shot and like you and give yourself an opportunity to like them too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and, uh, yeah. And then I would also say, I think, you know, even if you're, if your culture is not a writing culture, that's okay. Um, writing has been a huge thing for us and our, our church and our team, but I don't, I don't think it's the act of writing necessarily as much as it, as it was the act of accomplishing things together. Do yeah. something, yeah. be, be with your team and take on missions together. Uh, Mm -hmm. it could be, it could be a local thing that you, you just, you tell your team like, Hey, um, today we're, we as a worship team are going to go and serve at this thing together. Mm -hmm. And while we're together, we're going to serve and we're going to laugh. We're going to have fun. We're going to take pictures and just enjoy one another and enjoy accomplishing something together. I think when you accomplish things together, if you win together, it's a memory that that's created. Um, but it's also a win that you can share with each other. And, and you just like, there's so many things that come about when you spend time together. So those are, those are a few things I, I would say, just yeah. love your people. Um, know that your approval, is not from them. I think so often as leaders, we, we die at the approval of people. Um, the very people that we're serving, we so badly want their approval that, uh, we actually can't serve them in the way that they need to be served. Mm -hmm. So, um, understand your approval from the Lord and then go accomplish something together. It doesn't have to be writing a song or a record. It could just be going and, 
um, serving out a food pantry and you, yeah, you accomplish that together or building something, building a deck for somebody. Um, just be with your team, be among your team, listen to your team, love your team, laugh with your team. And, mm-hmm. uh, above all, give your whole self and give them Jesus. And I think your whole team will be built on the foundation that is unshakable, which is the gospel. Uh, if the word is the center of all of it. Amen. Wow. There is so, so much in there, so much encouragement, so many gold nuggets. So thank you for that. And everyone who's listening, I hope that, that you're encouraged and that you write those things down. Or if you're driving in your car, you know, pull into the parking lot and rewind and and write those things down because there is just so much truth and so much power behind what, what you're saying, because that, truly is at the at the core of it all like you said just just love people (laughs) just love them and you say you know like it sounds cliche but it's like man it's it's so true though you know we can think that but it's like at the core of it that's that's really what it is and so I thank you for for sharing all of that and for encouraging our people today and I I just would love for you to share about the music a little bit and tell people uh you know about the record that you guys released in May and you've got something coming up and I think everyone's going to be excited to go check it out yeah so uh back in May we released our second full length live record volume two we got really creative with the title volume two it's just a second volume (laughs) of songs um but yeah i i think volume one was received really well uh and volume two i think is an even even better offering uh our church has been singing these songs for almost two years which is crazy uh wow i love it because we we can know that the songs are actually serving our people before we invest yeah. all that there is to invest in a record. Um, you want to make sure that at least your people are served. Uh, but we've yeah. also been able to sing these songs on the road and we're hearing of other churches that are leading the songs, which is just a really wild idea, really wild reality that I hope I never get over um, hearing somebody else say, hey, we're singing your song in our context and it's serving us well. So um, hmm. volume two is out everywhere that you stream. You can find it on your favorite uh, spot. Even if uh, you know if LimeWire is still a thing, you could probably illegally download it there, even though it's not really, <laughs> it not really makes sense to do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> um, but then also uh, what you just referenced, we have a Christmas record that we've been working on uh, this this year. So Christmas has kind of been, I, I've always loved Christmas. I've, it's my favorite time of the year. And this year it's unique because I've literally been working on Christmas all year long. Uh, we were recording All Holy Night on Thursday uh, before Good Friday. And then Good Friday, we're singing about the blood of Jesus. But I, but I do think like the, the approach that we're taking with Christmas is kind of to resolve Christmas. I think so many Christmas songs sing about Jesus's birth and his arrival, but they don't always get to why he came. Hmm. And so what we're trying to do with these songs is to resolve the celebration. Jesus came to save sinners, and he did that by taking on the cross and so we're we're singing about the cross and the manger because i think the cross mm-hmm. resolves the purpose of the manger and then it all leads to an empty tomb and uh right standing with the father in christ uh, because of his finished work and so we have nine songs that are in that we have about four or five originals that we've contributed to to the mix so we'll have some songs that are familiar and new new songs for people to add to their playlist or set list and whatnot. But I'm super pumped about that. That's like, I'm excited about uh, how that might resource our people and uh, other churches. Yeah. Wow. That that's really exciting. I'm, I'm seeing all over the place on, you know, different worship 
leading groups that I'm a part of, they're all talking tactically about Christmas already. Like what, yeah. what songs are you guys doing for Christmas or what, you know, like I need to start thinking ahead. And so that's pretty exciting that you are releasing some new songs into the world as well. And I know that I'll be excited to, to check that out when it comes out as well. Yeah. And, um, so everybody, we will put all of these links in the show notes. Be sure to check out journey worship co and their newest record from may and stay tuned for their Christmas record coming out in the fall. Brett, thank you so much for spending time and encouraging our people today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's an honor to, to be on. So appreciate you. Thank you so much for listening today, everybody. If you enjoyed today's episode, please hit subscribe so you never miss another one. And we want to know what you love about the Overflow Worship Podcast. So please leave a review and tell us. And if your platform doesn't have review options, just head on over to uh, Apple Podcasts and you can hit leave a review there. And it's not only to help us know what you're enjoying, but it also helps us to deliver you more relevant content and to keep reaching other people. And don't forget that we have a free gift for you. My plan for creating an impactful, meaningful set list every single time while streamlining and working smart and saving you time is yours for free when you visit overflowworship.com slash set list checklist. All right, that's all for today. Thanks again. Keep on thriving. Keep on thriving.